I did. This is impossible. It's possible. It's real. It's happening now. And the problems have to end now. You have to learn the stakes here. Start walking back now before I kill you. You say one word or throw one look, I'll kill you right here and now. I liked you, Ezekiel. Your people are gonna look up at the sanctuary fence, and they're gonna see their king is dead. Say to do yourselves a favor and cooperate now. I can now. do someone else? This is who I am. I live, you die. This is what this is. The petty compromises I made to avoid conflict were always done in the name of saving my people's lives. I said he's going to kill you. And there's nothing I can do to stop that. Hey. You hear me? I ferried my people to freedom. What befalls me now matters not. No, it matters, idiot. I have to. Welcome everyone to Dead Talk Live. I'm your host Viz from Walking Dead Now, and I want to help. Uh, I want everyone to help me welcome our very special guest tonight, Jason Warner Smith, our uh, beloved Gavin from The Walking Dead. Jason, thank you, and welcome uh, to our show. Thank you so much for agreeing to be with us. How are you doing? I'm fine, Viz. I'm fine. It's my pleasure to be here. And how are you tonight? I'm doing pretty well. Excited for our chat tonight. And let's get just, <laughs> let's start. There's a lot to talk about. Out of all of Negan's lieutenants, your character, Gavin, was one that showed that he still knew a little bit of right from wrong. Now, with that being said, let's just start off with Gavin's and Ezekiel's relationship. Would you say that that little bit of respect between the two went both ways or was it just more Gavin showing Ezekiel a little bit of respect and Ezekiel doing what he had to do to keep his people safe? Well, that's a lot to unpack there, Viz. That's, that's a very well-written question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, so to make sure I'm clear on this, you know, was it a two-way street between Gavin and Ezekiel as far as trying to be fair to each other? Respectful. Like, did you think the respect yeah. was two ways, or was it more one way, Gavin respecting Ezekiel, and Ezekiel doing what he had to do to uh, keep his people safe? Right, right. And by the way, for anybody who hasn't seen all of the episodes, I guess we just met through the massive spoiler there. Uh, doesn't turn out well for Gavin. No. Uh, <laughs> um... You know that that um, that uh, changed over time. In the beginning, um, you know, it, people ask me a lot, like, "How do you think you know this all came together?" I think Gavin just got lucky and, and, and came upon the kingdom and said, "Wow, here is this bunch of goofy people doing goofy stuff." And they're very productive, mm -hmm. very passive. They don't want to fight. They're not going to cause any problems. And this guy, if he wants to call himself a king and dress up funny and carry a stick and have all this silliness, that's fine. I went to Renaissance Festival before the zombie apocalypse, and that's fun. Okay, it's not my bag. But you know what? They show up with this stuff every week. Um, and I'm going to, you know, treat him as nice as I can. Because that's, that's kind of Gavin's bag. Was he was, you know, you had Simon who was just crazy. Mm -hmm. bit of a, a, a bit of a psychopath. And then you've got the narcissist show, uh, sociopath, Megan. And then Gavin, you know, there was a line that, that a lot of people probably missed with um, Megan. Megan, after 
I died and they didn't know, I, and, you know, Simon and Megan didn't know I was dead yet. Um, you know, you know Simon's like, have you heard from Gavin? Have you heard from Gavin? He's like, no, I don't worry about Gavin. He's dry and tight. You know, that's what Megan said. And that, that was the thing. I was reliable. I might have been a pain in the ass. I might have been grumpy all the time, but I was reliable. Yes. And I, I kind of wanted to protect the kingdom. So, yeah, I respected them because they kept their word. As far as how they lived their lives, I thought it was ridiculous. Yeah. But it didn't matter. Um, and as far as Ezekiel, back to... Um, sorry, I gotta, thought I turned the TV off on the side. He was flashing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I, I don't think you know Ezekiel you know, hated us um, uh, and did not respect me. I mean, to, to the effect of like, I was the nicest mobster around. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, he's he's the nicest bad guy we've ever met. Um, and because right there, and it was interesting. Right there at the end, his uh, Ezekiel's humanity really shows through uh, when he's trying to save me. He's trying to save me at the end, and uh, Gavin at yeah. the end, Gavin's. Uh, cowardice, cowardice is his doom. He's, he's, he's uh, you know, he's, I don't want to get political, but he's thrown himself behind a particular leader and he's this far in. He's like, well, I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm all in. Yeah. I'm going to change horses now. And you can't change because if I admit that I've been wrong all this time, I have to admit that I've been wrong all this time. So I'm, no, I'm right. You're wrong. I live, you die, this is how it works, I told you what to do, you didn't do it. But Ezekiel continues, like, dude, you, know, you can still turn, you can still come around, you yep. can still do it. Yeah, I think the long, long answer is that, not in the beginning, but toward the end, it kind of like, it went like this. You know, Gavin's respecting them, they're not respecting Gavin, and then it kind of switches. You watch this whole relationship change, and they're equal there for a little bit, and then it goes the other direction. Yeah. Um, so I hope that's a good answer. That's a great, that's a great answer. <laughs> now, we see Gavin numerous times uh, tell different characters that life under Negan is how it's got to be. It's how it's going to continue to be. Now, yeah. do you see Gavin... From his point of view, in trying to talk sense into people, rather than resorting to violence as a first resort, as a weakness to his character, as being Negan's lieutenant, or glimpses of his humanity, just not wanting to resort to violence right away. Yeah, I, that's the route I went with it. You know, but Gavin, you know, he's, he doesn't like that part of the savior. Yeah. He doesn't like the. That's why you know when he worked his way up to upper management and got assigned to his own outpost. And you know, there's a. Uh, you ever heard of a play called The Fiddler on the Roof? Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah. If this at the very very beginning, there's this song called Tradition, mm-hmm. and this one person walks up. You know, in the middle of the song, it's got dialogue, and they sing in dialogue. And the, uh, one of the characters walks up to the rabbi and says, "Rabbi, is there?" Is there a prayer for the czar? There's a prayer for the czar. Yes, may the Lord bless and keep the czar far away from us. And that's that's the way Gavin held Negan. Okay, gotcha. Keep him as far away from us as possible, and all of his, you know, sanctuary shenanigans with irons and fires and cutting people and smashing people and all that stuff because I didn't want any I, 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 I survived all that and got to go out to my little island and all I got to do is make my shipments on time and he leaves me alone yeah and I go out I get I got the kingdom I probably had some other people I was shaking down but the kingdom obviously you know they didn't yeah. have time for stories but Shake down the kingdom, get the stuff to him. I keep some. He goes to Negan. Negan takes care of me. Gets me men and guns, and stuff, you know, and I can sit in my lazy boy and drink a cold beer at the end of the day, or whatever it was we had. Exactly. That was, yeah. yeah. And that that was Gavin. I mean, he was lazy, uh, grumpy, and, and a coward. That's so. yeah, That sums it up pretty well. Now, 
Jared, who was played by Joshua Michael, was one of Gavin's men. Okay. Yeah. Now, why did Gavin continue to bring, in your opinion, why did Gavin continue to bring Jared to those meetings with the kingdom if he knew he was just going to take a tense situation and only make it worse? It's in the script, man. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I get that question a lot. Josh and I, especially when we're together, we always get that question. And a um, couple of different theories we have around that. The mm -hmm. uh, main one is, though, the, not so much the theory, but the fact of it is that Josh does like killing and hurting and being just a jackass in general. So when push comes to shove and Gavin's got to do some dirty business he's got he's got his guy yeah all right jared take care of it shoot him do it you know beat the guy up whatever it is and he's like a bad dog it's like he doesn't you gotta pull him back off you know stop okay it's enough it's enough you know um that's the logical reason behind it the but then it's like surely there's some other you know tough guy in your crew that can handle that sort of thing so why would you put up with this complete lunatic um smart ass just you know asshole exactly and we we decided that he must be like negan's nephew or something <laughs> <laughs> or something or he's my nephew or there's some there's something there that you know negan's like hey it's jared take care of him anything happens to him same thing happens to you yeah. boom hey, that's all gavin needs to hear that makes yeah. complete sense, actually. It does make complete sense. Now, when yeah. when Rick and company uh, surround the sanctuary at the start of All Out War, and Negan, yourself, and the other lieutenants come out, uh, Gavin is the only one to speak up when Rick begins his countdown. Now, you yeah. can very easily argue that Gavin speaking up could be seen as a weakness to Negan. But sure. as you've touched on earlier, we never see Negan in any way, shape, or form put Gavin down. Now we know that's not displayed on the scene on this on the, the show, but why do you think that is? Well we shot that actually. Oh we shot a take, we shot a take like that. Because um, JDM was like you know, I would I would turn on him. I wouldn't put up with this shit. Exactly. And so we did actually did a couple of takes where he turns around and goes, "Shut up!" You know, just stares me down. But they didn't use that take. Um, and when we did the reverse, we didn't even shoot it. I don't think. But yeah, he was not. He was. His instinct was to turn around and threaten me. Yeah. And um, so we did a few of those. But at the end of the day, you know, that's up to the, uh, the director and the editors and the showrunners. So we did not use that tape. So yeah, he, you know, that was definitely. I mean, Gavin was a level-headed guy. He's like, look, you know, we've got it. We've all got a great thing going here. Surely we can come to some sort of arrangement. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all, you know, let's all just be level-headed here. And I'm not the big dick swinging around Negan and Rick character. I'm not the leader of men and women. I'm, I'm, a, I'm the second in command. I'm the leader of a, a group, but I'm still, I have a leader. I'm not the top dog, and I, I don't want to be the top dog, and I would never be a good top dog. Mm -hmm. Again, I, again, I say, ah, Gavin. Um, so, but, you know, Gavin's also not really afraid of me and like, I mean, he is, but not not as much as he probably should be. There are times when he's just like, you know, time out. And he actually says, I love that. Why is it? Hey, can we just take a time out here? You know, let's, yeah. just, let's just all sit down. Let's just cool our heads and think about this. This is crazy. Or, you know, a lot of people are about to die. Of course, I never understood why Rick just didn't, you know, shoot Negan right then. And, you know, oh, yeah. I, I was actually thinking of that, too, when I was preparing for this show. And... This has been mulled over by fans thousands of times over. Yeah. They had him surrounded. All of you guys were exposed. Uh, all they had yeah. to do is take a shot and end the war well, before it started. Yeah, I mean, well, Rick was trying to, I think if I remember the, the logic behind all that was that Rick was trying to get the savior, Negan, to be rational and say, okay, okay, we give, 
we've been bad, let's, let's call a truce and let's work together, as opposed to just murdering the guy. And uh, even though, what, a month earlier, or yeah. I don't know how timeline, they murdered, what, eight or ten of their uh, saviors in their sleep. Exactly. Right? And, it's, and, whenever, and it's a joke of mine, whenever somebody says, so, how'd you like playing a bad guy on the on the Walking Dead? I said, bad guy? Yeah. really a good guy. What are you talking about? Who's Rick and his people are the crazy ones. Yeah, I've mentioned it before. The good, <laughs> bad, they don't exist in the Walking Dead. It's all a matter of reference. Now, yeah. do, do you feel... If it started... If it had started with the saviors, it would have been a different story. You know? yeah, exactly. Now, do you feel, again, uh, with Rick, when he surrounded him, and like you said, he didn't. He wanted to give him a chance to surrender. Now, we know Rick had an ego, okay? He had an ego. He made his share of bad decisions. Do you think there was a part of uh, Rick uh, that just wanted to break Negan the way Negan broke Nick? Uh, sorry, Rick? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Just a different way. I mean, if you, you know, I haven't looked at that stuff since it came out on the, you know, when it when it aired back in the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rick was talking with all of his people. He's just like, look, here's the plan. You know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pin him down, and we're gonna you know we're gonna, and we're gonna get him to, to work with us. Yeah. Exactly. So I think some of his other people were like, let's just kill them all. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't remember who said what, but it was something. He's like, no, it's not how we work, uh, even though we've done it before. <laughs> not how we're going to do it this time. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, Rick's ego, we've seen it throughout the series show, has led to him making some pretty bad decisions. Now, let's move on to, your, to Gavin's death scene, uh, okay. which, in my opinion, you got a kick-ass death. Uh, okay. spectacular <laughs> there are characters who went out that would have loved to have gotten the death scene that you got now before yeah. we get to specific questions about it when you sure. read the script the entirety of how your character was going to come to an end were you satisfied on uh, Gavin's ending on The Walking Dead by reading the script and seeing you know how they're going to play your character out Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, because I knew I was going to die before I read the script. You know, they, they tell you that. Yeah. Um, and so I'm like, all right, well, how's this going to go down? And as I was reading that script, um, well, what's in? I don't want to. I don't want to evolve too much here, but when you're not a series regular on the show, when you're a, a recurring guest star, which is what my character uh, was, um, you don't get the whole script oh. of, of the entire episode most of the time. Okay. And they do that just, you know, to try to protect the script so it doesn't get out. Yeah. Not that they don't trust us, but the, the more scripts they send out, the riskier it gets. I get you. So, because, um, you know, I could leave it somewhere by accident. You know, it's just, it's just your, it's just the probabilities grow higher of a mistake. So they, they limit sending out full scripts. Um, so after I read my scenes, I could tell that there was all this inner splice stuff with Carl. And I knew that Carl was going to you know, bite the big one, too. I, I'd heard that through the grapevine, but then it was confirmed when I read the script. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I went, and it, for the one and only time that I actually had a rehearsal, uh, I went in and I met with Greg Nicotero and we sat down at a table and we had Kari on the phone, as a matter of fact. We had Kari and I had all those big scenes together. And um, uh, Kari played in Ezekiel. Yes. And so we, he was in L.A. at the time with his family and we were on the phone because it was during the um, summer break. They take three weeks off, well, during a normal time. They take three weeks off in July because it's the hottest time of the year. and. It's, it, it, it lines up with the break that they take later in the season. So it's a, a three-week vacation in the middle. Gotcha. Anyway, and um, he said, so have you read the script? And I'm like, no, Greg. And he said, oh, God. Hey, uh, bring Jason the script down here. So I got a script. So reading the whole script, I could not have been more thrilled than the fact that I was going to get Basically, it was an episode about two characters. Mm -hmm. 
and Carl. Yeah. Oh, I was ec- I was ecstatic, but then I was also pretty much like, well, fuck, nobody's going to even notice that I got killed. <laughs> <laughs> That's Carl's going down. I said, can't they, can you do Carl like one more episode? Like, <laughs> one more, you know. Save it to the mid-season premiere. <laughs> You know, I, I never got to uh, I never got to go and sit on the couch on the Talking Dead because my episode where I died is the episode where Carl died. So of course they had him on yeah. by himself, which I totally understand. Yeah. that. it was just it was disappointing at the time. My wife was like, "This is bullshit." Right now. <laughs> um, so, but no, I when I was talking, you know, I was just I thank Greg. I don't know how many times I'm like, this is just amazing. He, you know, it, yeah, because basically it turns into a John Carpenter film uh-huh. about half through, and and I'm and I'm on the wrong end of it. I'm not the monster, you know. No. And Lenny James uh, playing Morgan is the monster, which is the other amazing thing about my short run uh, compared to others, a long run, but you know, uh, my my wonderful run of The Walking Dead is that I got to invest and spend and hang out with and work with Lenny James. Mm. And if you had, you know, asked me five years prior to that, like, hey, Jason, you think you'll ever get to do you know, a one-on-one scene with Lenny James? I'm like, hell no, that'll never happen, man. Mm. Are you kidding me? You might as well ask me if I'm going to do a one-on-one scene with, you know, Meryl Streep. No, it's not going <laughs> to happen. <laughs> you know, and then what happened? And you know, we we're, we're not buddies, we're not besties or friends. You know, I, I have his phone number. I do text him from time to time, but I don't want to bother him too much because we're not like best friends or anything. But we know each other now, and if we ran into each other, we, we would you know uh, talk. Uh-huh. But he's just one of the greatest actors, one of the best actors on that show. My favorite episode of all time is Clear. Yes, it's, it's, season three. It, it, I mean, after I saw that episode, I'm like, give that guy an Emmy. Yeah. Let's just be with it. And, you know, no, not even a nomination. And I was just like, okay, whatever. It was just, he was brilliant. Um, and I love, you know, he's done some silly movies, but most of the movies he's been in, I just absolutely love. Mm-hmm. Um, anyhow, uh, you know, what was that? short-lived TV show he had when he left The Walking Dead for a while. Unfortunately, it was not that good, but he was great in it. L- um, Lenny is amazing. I mean, he's just yeah. fabulous. There's not uh, enough great words right. to yeah. say about him. Uh, and we're yeah. going to get more to that in your because we're going to break down your death scene some more. Now, 808, 809 were just fantastic. I, I couldn't ask for anything more. Exactly. For a local actor working on a local show that's worldwide, that I'm from Atlanta and I got cast in that show and they gave me that level of difficulty and trusted me to do it is just the greatest honor I've ever had it, so far. It was epic. It was just, I mean, it's just flat out epic. Now, when Gavin is about to be killed by who he, he thinks, Lenny James Morgan, uh, right. the look uh, on your face is just one of pure horror. Now, do you think at that moment uh, Gavin feels remorse, or do you think he is just afraid that he knows he's about to die? It's pure fear. Yeah, but, um, it's pure fear. Remorse is, doesn't even come into it. Um, or that, at least that's how I played it. Yeah, I don't want to get into actors' tricks and things too much here, but or you know methods or technique, but. What really helped me a lot was I decided that that speech I have with Ezekiel in the theater where I'm like, no, 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 you don't get it. I live, you die, that's the way it is. I I did one take of that that they didn't use. Greg was like, that was real nice, but no, that's not what I want. Okay. Where it was where I literally like was st- almost almost cried while doing that because I was just like you're my brother you're the only person I can talk to I love you like a brother but due to the fact that you didn't do things like I told you to and I work for this crazy guy now you're going to die and I'm not going to have anybody that's how I played it 
it came across yeah, great. Yeah, pull up that, you know, and, and, and it was real. It was like this love, this bro love thing going on. Yeah. And 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 Nicotero was like that was really nice, Jason. But I I, I want you to you know play it more angry. Mm. And you know we, we I get what, I get where you're going, but it's not not what we're going for here. I'm like okay, but I was able to hold on to that that feeling. So when we're outside, because we, you know, the, the thing about it is that was all shot on location, and so when we came out, you know, it was very literal. We came out of that theater and we were literally in front of the theater by the, in the horse corral, and it was all, you know, we didn't. It was like it really happened. It was almost like a documentary at that point. Um, we didn't jump to another, you know, part of the the lot or anything. It was just like, nope, this is exactly real, and. So they, you know, uh, uh, Carol and Ezekiel are out there, and I, I don't know who Carol is. Uh, she's just a stranger. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, so the whole time I'm, I'm, I'm looking over at Ezekiel when Lenny's there with the stick about to kill me, and I'm just pleading with him with, you know, with my soul, like, help me. You know, yeah. that's what I'm going with. Yeah, yeah, and you played that great because uh, I had to ask you the question. But that look on your face, uh, I mean, I wanted to ask you, but I was like 99% sure it was just, you were afraid to die and you knew okay. what was coming. Uh, now, right. in those final yeah. moments. And Ezekiel was trying to save me, but he, he was too late. I fucked it all up. <laughs> now, in your final moments, you're in that scene with uh, Carrie Payton, Melissa McBride, uh, and Lenny James. Carol, yeah. uh, played by Melissa McBride, is actually trying to talk Morgan down from killing yeah. you, which is a, so, sort of an uh, ironic twist between those two because uh, several seasons earlier it was reversed, okay? Mm -hmm. But Lenny's uh, response, Morgan's response is, I have to. My question to you, in your opinion, why do you feel that Morgan has to kill you? He has no other choice but to kill Gavin. Because he knows what it is. Well, explain. Um, you know, when I came back later as a, as a, as a kind of a specter in, in Morgan's mind, and I kept saying, you know what it is, you know what it ah, is. Ah, yeah. It's because he didn't kill his wife back in episode one. Ah, gotcha. Wife ended up killing his son. Yeah. And then... It was, I forgot the other thing. He should have, um, he should have killed somebody else. And, and, and the wolves, he, the wolves. Right. Yeah, the wolves. And they, he let them go. He let some of them go. He kept one of them as a prisoner, and one of the people he let go put. He put other people's lives in jeopardy. Yeah, I read for that role too. <laughs> yeah, you know, and so yeah, that and and you know. Um, God, you know, like, well, he did end up killing Richard, but, you know, he let Benjamin get killed, you know, because um, he hesitated, he hesitated, and he was, you know, going, and so he, he goes from being this total pacifist into becoming a complete and total psychopath. Mm -hmm. And so Carol's like, come back, come back from the ledge, you've gone too far, Yeah, you need to do this, this you know, you don't need to do this. You don't need to. Plus, you know, and, and let's look at it from a writer's point of view. It gives the audience, like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Gotcha. He's going to pull back. Because there were, you know, uh, I, I'm assuming this is true. People tell me this all the time. But, you know, a lot of people were rooting for Gavin to turn the corner. Yeah, I was one of them. And so that was, and it was, you know, we, and that's how we, you know, we, that's how that character was written. Like, he, he's redeemable. Mm -hmm. He's got liver of humanity left in him. Mm-hmm. And a turn, which is, of course, a death sentence on The Walking Dead. So as soon as you show any humanity, you're, you're dead. So anyway, so that, that is ironic that it was her pulling him back. I, but, you know, that, again, that on the day of, I was just like, yeah, lady, whoever the hell you are, tell him, you know, because I didn't know who Carol was. I no, never that was the her. first time you've ever, that Gavin ever saw her. Yeah, I mean, the last time I saw her, she was trying to kill me. Yeah, yeah. You know, so. so, I mean, if you had a chance, uh, let's put you in the writer's chair, and you were uh, writing out Gavin's character arc, 
Would you have changed anything or would you have left Gavin's arc completely the way it was played out uh, from what, you know, um, based on what we saw on the screen? Would you have made any changes or would you have left it as is? Well, the only change I would have made is he would have survived. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great because that brings me to my next question. He would have, he would have made a five-year time jump and have become like some kind of, you know, uh, management within the, the Alexandria or something like that. But no, uh, no, otherwise, no. Um, there was nothing... Every, you know, it's interesting that, that that scene you showed in the clip at the beginning was Benjamin's death. Yeah. That, I, you know, that was my first really big scene. And I remember I got that script. It's 10 pages of dialogue. And I got it a day and a half before we shot again. I only got my pages. Yeah. I got them. Um, and I had to just bust my ass to learn those lines quick. And then I had to then perform them not just know them. And luckily it all came together. Carter was really cool. He worked with me some, you know, he gave some of his time to help me work. And, um, um, and we, you know, came up with some ideas together, but I was able to try things out with him mm -hmm. you know, in practice. But, um, sorry, I've, I've lost my train of thought, but yeah, the, if I would write anything different, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change. Yeah, and, and the, the nice thing about it, and this is the uh, the, the lovely, wonderful uh, thing is for an actor, and I've only experienced this twice now, once on Rectify and, and then on The Walking Dead, where they start to write to you and how you are playing the character. Yeah. So they, they, they pick up on how you are, your, your persona, your... Your inner person. You know, yeah, you I, just, I totally get you. Yeah, and then they write around that because that's that's why they get paid the big bucks because they're great writers and they write around you to make it work. Yeah, and it right into my wheelhouse and it's like, oh, this is so much better. The first script was tough, and they just got easier and easier and easier. Yeah, and they gave all kinds of crazy stuff to do that I would never even thought of, and that whole thing where I never turn my back. You know, I keep my back. I keep my back to the violence that whole cantaloupe scene. And it's like in the script, it says he still doesn't turn around. He still doesn't just turn around. It's not like we decided that on the day. That was in the script. Wow. And, you know, that's the thing about The Walking Dead that I haven't experienced anywhere else is they, the script is, is the law. And if you want to make a change, it takes a, it takes a committee. Oh, wow. uh, I asked for one change one time and he's like, I'll never do that again. Because <laughs> Still no, but it's just like you had to go through a whole list of people, and they're like, no. I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna do that again. <laughs> okay, I will, I will make it work. I will make it work. So exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, a line or two here and there, but no, nothing, nothing. I would change nothing other than Gavin turns the corner and becomes a good guy. Well, uh, you know, we heard the story, and I've had Michael Cudlitz on here where. He had lived a line where he tells Negan that night where he kills him, suck my nuts. And uh, right. they kept that. You know, he didn't, I guess he didn't run it. It just came to uh, Michael Cudlitz and uh, he just decided to say it and they kept it. You know, so. Yeah. I mean, that could have happened with me too, but I didn't, I, I also wasn't a series regular. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go now to, you know, you would have wanted Gavin to survive. Let's assume that Gavin did survive. The world's unfair. The current world we live in is unfair. The uh, zombie apocalyptic world is even more unfair, okay? So, yeah, yeah, it doesn't make sense that a person as evil as Negan was back then gets to live. And then you right. have another character like yourself, Gavin, who does show glimpses of humanity, and he gets killed, and gets killed by a, like, 10-year-old boy, no less. Uh, yeah. And if it wasn't Henry who did it, Morgan would have taken you out. Now, if you did survive, how would you have seen Gavin adapting to life within the communities as we saw some of the other saviors do after they lost the war? Oh, he would have, you know, uh, he would have. Once, once everything settled down. Now, you know, let's let's pretend that they showed the five years between the you know, the time during the time jump. Uh huh. He would have become somebody that helped 
you know, like, uh, I don't know, forgive me, I don't know the actor or the character's name, but the, the gentleman who was wonderful that played the blacksmith at the hilltop. Oh, uh, Earl. Earl. You know, someone like that. He would have been a very helpful, handy, uh, good manager of people, get tasks done, fix the fence, you know, deal with things like that. He probably still would have been lazy. They would have had, like, Gavin? What the hell? You know? <laughs> Would have been complaining about everything, um, you know. Still, because that's just his nature. But you know, he would have, he would have morphed. Because the only reason he was his savior, and this is the way I always held it, the only reason he was his savior is because that's who he ended up with. If he'd ended up at Alexandria, he'd have fit in there. Exactly. If he'd ended up at Hilltop, he would have fit in there. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. not hard to figure out. Like uh, you know, kingdom. It- uh, he might have had a hard time with that one, but he'd probably figure out some way to fit in there. You know, yeah. I got, I got to wear what? I got to wear this thing and ride a stick and a horse. All right, fine, whatever it takes. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, cause I don't, I never made a decision about like, did he lose a wife and kids and all that? Um, I think most people assume probably yes, but um, yeah, I never really, I didn't really use that as a, something to to work with. But yeah, I mean, he would have, he would have just fit right in after you know, paying his penance and you know whatever they were going to do to him while he was, you know, I'm trying to think what you know, um, Lindsley uh, Register. Register, right? Laura. Laura's character, you know, whatever she went through, it would have been similar. Yeah. Now the yeah. the majority of your scenes on The Walking Dead were uh, we already discussed Lenny, but Carrie, Peyton, Joshua, Michael as well as J.D. Morgan and that one last one with Melissa McBride. What We know you've described Lenny. What was it like working with the others, like J.D. Morgan and that one scene with Melissa and also a lot of scenes with Carrie? What was it like working with those group of actors? Well, uh, all very different. I mean, the, the, the biggest difference was from season seven to season eight, because in season seven, I was in three episodes, three scenes, and they were all in that parking lot with the kingdom. Yeah. All. And so it was the same people every time. And uh, the background guys uh, changed from week to week or, you know, episode to episode, but mostly the same background guys even. Yeah. Um, so, but that, you know, when we would, you know, in between setups, when we would be hanging out, waiting for the next setup, we would stay there in that parking lot under a tent or whatever. And, you know, we'd be talking about theater and TV shows and movies and music and all the things that we like and, and, um, and that kind of thing. It was very, very actory, okay? Very thespian. And then in season eight, we all get split up and I end up, for the first time, hanging out with the saviors, mm-hmm. and um, that was night and day. Wow! Because wow. the character, the pe- you know, again, I'm not saying that JDM is a psychopathic murderer, but that personality is his personality. He's very much like that character, Austin Emilio, very much like his character. Um, um, I would say that. Um, oh man. I'm getting old, Viz. Oh, um, I hear you, man. I hear you. I'm right there uh, with you. Not the governor. Um, Gregory, what the hell's his name? Oh. Uh, you know what? I'm drawing a mind blank, too, but oh, I know. And I'm in Christ. Hopefully he doesn't see this. <laughs> he, is, he was not like Gregory. He's a, he's a very decent human being. Um, but those guys, you know, their characters are a lot like them. Josh McDermott. You know, it's all it was all cut up. You know, they were doing this stuff all the time, you know, and punching each other. It's like being in a fraternity. And it was just a totally different atmosphere. Uh, JDM is, a, is, a, is an excellent actor, very hardworking, knows his lines, does his work. Uh, we did. We never had any conversations. No. It wasn't like, oh, Jason, how was your day? None of that. You know, he was very business only. And then, you know, off he went. Um, Austin was nice, but he's quiet. Uh, Josh McDermott is always very much in his script a lot. Um, Carol, uh, Michelle, Melissa McBride, she's a big goofball. I, you're she's not the first to say that. 
it's like a, you know that's one of the things that I teach acting and one of the things I'm always telling my actors is like look when you were five and six years old you were a perfect actor <laughs> you were perfect then and then life happened you grew up you were told to be quiet sit down be still be civilized do this do that and she skipped that step somehow <laughs> and stayed like a big five or six year old in a grown woman's body and that's what makes her such a great actor mm -hmm. that's why she's close to her emotions and she's just goofy and you know so I didn't spend a lot of time with her just a couple of nights when we were working on that one scene but she was she was nice I mean she was a casting uh, director here in the Atlanta area for years and I don't remember if I ever auditioned for her or not back in the day but um, but you know she's also an actress and then this you know this role has changed her life forever oh, yeah. Um, I mean, she wasn't even supposed to live past two episodes, and you know now that she's going to have her own series. Exactly. Uh, yeah. But uh, which is great, uh, you know, that, that's just fantastic. Um, but you know, it was just it, it was wonderful. Uh, Cooper Andrews, getting to know him, he is he is he is Jerry. He is Jerry. Big lovable he, teddy bear. Oh, he's just the nicest, most genuine friendliest person in the world. Um, Josh Michael is nothing like his character. Nothing like his character. He is just the sweetest, you know, grooviest gardener. You'll get to know him in a, in a yep, few days. Yeah, Joshua was going to be on with us in nine uh, days. He, yeah. He, he's really good at playing shit heels. He's really good at it. Um, kind of like the, damn it, what's his name? Plus Gregory. Really good at playing shit heels. Yeah. You know, me, I'm a nice guy. I'm good at playing shit heels too. <laughs> uh, but, um, so I think I answered, uh, you were asking about all those folks, but it's like working with them. Everybody was super professional and everybody was very on their game, no jacking around. Uh, I mean, there was, there was jacking around, but because we had earned it, because we were prepared and we did our job when the camera rolled, you know, and rehearsals were on and we had to do things. Uh, but it, it, it's a strange, this is, you know, I'm going to go off on a sidebar here. It's, 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 it's a strange place to be in um, when you're working as a, a, a quote-unquote recurring guest star. Yeah. Because they pay us well, but we're, we're getting like the league minimum, okay? Mm -hmm. um, whereas when you're in constant contact with the series regulars, Josh McDermott, Austin Emilio, JDM, you know, uh, all the main characters, they are getting paid vastly more than you are. But you're doing the exact same work on the exact same day. And as far as I'm concerned, and hopefully they're concerned, and I would I, I don't have any examples of it not being this way, we're equals. You know, we're all actors there doing a job. Exactly. And we treat each other that way. But it's still there, you know. There's this weird, you know, like people showing you pictures of the new house they just bought and the the 13th motorcycle they just bought. Yeah. It's just like this whole other world. And I'm thinking, like, hey, we just went into overtime, ching, and they're like, fuck, how much longer is this going to take? Because <laughs> you know? they get paid the same no matter what. Yeah. And, but it's a lot more. So they, you know, the less time they can work, the better. And for me, who's getting paid based upon how long I'm there, yeah. the more I can work, the better. I got you. I got you. And, and everybody knows about it on both sides. It's just as awkward for them as it is for us. Um, so it's just a weird, you know. I, I imagine because I don't know what it's like yet. Um, when it's just all the series regulars, it's a different world. Because they all live in the same world. Yeah. And then when it's, you know, like when we were doing all that stuff um, in season seven in the parking lot, the only person there that was a series regular was Lenny James. Yeah. Everybody else were new. And we were all on that same level playing field as far as, you know, we knew who we were. And, you know, there were people there that still had jobs. You know, they had, it's like, you know, I got to work tomorrow, you know, after I get off, off the set. Wow. Yeah. You know, I got to go do the other job that I do. Yeah. Because this, 
this is nice for one day's work, but I'm not doing this every day. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, when I shot, when I shot season seven, I worked four days. Yeah. One episode, one day, one episode, one day, and the last episode, two days. So for that whole entire season, I worked four days. Wow. I get paid by the day. So I hear you. Wasn't getting rich. I wasn't complaining. I'm just, you know, it's just a weird that I don't think most people realize. They think that, you know, we're all rich, but we're not. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, Close. yeah. So no. let's talk about uh, some of the different directors. Now, we've discussed yeah. Greg Nicotero plenty of times with other guests. I want to ask you about Michael Satrazimus. He was also a guest on our show. Uh, what was your experience uh, being directed by Michael? And how is Michael. he different from a Greg Nicotero? Okay. Well, when you're dealing with Greg, you're also dealing with, the, you know, like God. He's like the, the show God. He runs that place. Yeah. And he's also the, you know, he's head of makeup and everything. And he write well, yeah. He write, you know, hmm, I don't know if he helps with. I don't say I don't know if he writes or not. To be honest with you, but he's just in charge of so much, and he's directing. So when you're with him, you know, I, you know, he was great. He was the one that hired me. So you know, my first episode was directed by him. Uh -huh. So that was a little um, intimidating. Um, and then my last episode, he was you know painting the makeup on me, and I felt like you know this is. You're the you're the master. You're the, the makeup master, and you're painting on me. This is this must be how the piece of canvas felt with Michelangelo. You know, yeah. it's like that felt like you know. Um, so Greg's great, and you know he's he works quickly, and he knows exactly what he wants, and he also experiments and tries new things. Uh, they all do. Um, Mikey was uh, Mikey's a lot of fun. He's just he's he's very he's. Uh, He's a he's a cut up, and he's funny, and you know he comes from the camera side of things. He's a he you know he was a cinematographer first, and then he became a director. I think I have that right. Yes, you did. Yeah. And he has a really good sense of humor, and he's and he and he and he's a great cheerleader. You know, he's like, yeah, that's great, Jason. That's great. I love it because I you know he directed the stuff where I was like in the back of the truck with a megaphone and I punched Kari and all that kind of stuff. And that night got longer and longer and longer, and I had my big scene with Kari where I punch him out and I tell him, like, I like you, Ezekiel, and all that stuff. It's my big scene, and he's like, you know, Jason, we got, you know, I, 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 want to, I really want to spend time on that scene because it's important that, you know, I, I get, and due to, you know, all the stunts and fire and guns and all the stuff and, and fights and everything, our scene got pushed to the last minute, and literally the sky is turning pink as we're shooting that scene. Um, and he's like, "I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. You know, I didn't give you the time like I said I would." And he was just really cool about letting me know how upset he was that he kind of robbed me of that because we had kind of had to rush through it. We had to shoot it quick. Yeah, I was ready. I did a fine job. I would. I would love to have had more time to explore that scene and try it a bunch of different ways so they'd have more to cut with more editing to do and they'd have more choices and we only had a couple of you know I could do a couple of takes of each angle um, but he Mike has this tradition and that, luckily for me I got to experience it once and on the last day of any segment that he's shooting any episode he does something something special uh-huh and so the day that I was there, it was the end of, F, it was the day that they were shooting. You remember when um, Negan and Gabriel are stuck in that trailer? Yes. yes. They have the big fashion scene? Yes. They were shooting the stuff outside of that with all the walkers out in that alleyway. Uh -huh. And that was part of, I forgot what episode that was, but... Anyway, I was there that day. I don't know why I was there, because I wasn't working that day. It was costume or makeup or something I had to come in and do. And it was the final day of shooting for that episode. And so right as they got, when lunch came around, they said, everybody stay right here. 
and they came out and they started and they had boxes and boxes and boxes of like little brown school lunches and they started handing them out to everybody and I'm like they're like don't open them don't open them don't open them and I'm standing there with my little bag lunch and like, what the hell is going on I'm like I don't know what do you think's going on and they said okay now open them up you open them up and there's like a peanut butter sandwich and a carton of milk. I mean, it was just like straight up school lunch, right? Yeah. But inside there was a piece of paper and it had the words to We Are the Champions by the Queen. By the Queen, yeah. Right as we pull the pieces of paper out, this big garage door rolls up and there's a mariachi band playing We Are the Champions that he hired. Oh my God. So, the whole cast and crew breaks out into We Are the Champions to the mariachi band. Oh, man. <laughs> and it was like, this is insane. And that was Michael's and, idea. That was Michael's idea. Wow. And he did something. And, and as far as you, you should ask your other guests, you know, uh, I heard about I heard about other things, but I can't remember any of them. But he always had some kind of big finish at the end of every one of his episodes. That is awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, we're almost getting close to time. I do want to ask uh, uh, some questions outside of The Walking Dead. Now, from 2013 to 2014, you also starred as Wendell Jelks, a death row inmate uh, who was also an antagonist in the critically acclaimed TV show Rectify, which you mentioned earlier. Uh, another Walking Dead star also had a role in that series, and that was Michael Trainer, who was our guest two nights ago, who played yeah. Nicholas on The Walking Dead. Yeah. Now, since both of you starred on The Walking Dead after Rectify, was it a planned deal that you would both audition for a role on The Walking Dead together? Uh, even though your character made his debut in season seven, Nicholas made it in season five. Did you guys go in on that together or it was just coincidence? No, just total coincidence. Matter of fact, I mean, I know Michael, Michael knows me, but we're, again, we're not like buddies or anything. I, he lives in Los Angeles now. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, all of his work on Rectify was completely separate from all of my work on Rectify. Matter of fact, my work on Rectify was separate from everybody because I was in prison the whole time. Yeah. Um, except for, you know, a couple of the characters, the main character and then Johnny, uh, uh, Daniel played by Aiden Young. Yeah. And um, Johnny Ray Gill, who played, um, crap, I forgot his character's name now. I'm going to catch hell from the Rectify fans about <laughs> that. Um, shit. Anyway, we were all the inmates there. Um, so, yeah, I met Michael for the first time actually at Sundance for the premiere of the first two episodes of, Sun, of uh, Rectify. Uh -huh. I went out, uh, my, I had a bunch of friends, we used to go to Sundance every year just for the fun of it anyway. And so uh, some friends of, of mine and my wife and I went out to Park City for Sundance because they were gonna be screening the first two episodes of Rectify and we were invited to go and we went to go watch it and Michael was there and that's where I met him. And and we you know hi hi nice to meet you no 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 your scene was great and we go oh your scene was great da, da, da. and then uh, never saw him again and then he pops up on the walk with him like hey there's Georgie boy oh, he's back there he is oh man he's got a great role you know he you know it's funny he he was only in like five episodes but my God what an impact he made oh yeah he, he made on that show and um, and he moved out to L A not too long after that. Um, and he and I have spoken on the phone a few times since then, you know, just talking about actor stuff. Yeah. Hey, what's going on with you? What's, you know, what's this? What, what are you doing? And, um, and I honestly, I, I've seen him at a, a few comic cons and we've chatted briefly, but we're again, um, as far as, you know, him working on the dead and me working on the dead. Just coincidence. No, total coincidence. Cool. We're both. We're both Atlanta actors, and like he, I, uh, I watched a little bit of his interview to get ready for tonight, just to see how he operated. Yeah. And I think he said to you that you know he'd been auditioning every year. Yes, he did. Yeah. Same story. We have identical stories. You know, same for me. I, 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 I don't think I auditioned for season one, but I did audition for every season after that. You know, one role or another: a wolf, a doctor in Slab Town. And God knows what else, because you know the sides are fake, so you don't really know. But. Well, here's a little bit of info that you may not be aware of. Uh, oh. Michael Trainer and uh, yourself 
were in the exact same amount of episodes. He was in eight, and you were in oh. eight. Oh, okay. It was eight. Okay. Eight, yeah. So you both wow. got the same amount of episodes on The Walking Dead. <laughs> the perfect number. <laughs> now, as a final question, before we run out of time, you <laughs> touched on this earlier as well. Tell us what uh, led you to becoming uh, an acting instructor slash teacher. Um, I'll, I'll try to tell us as quickly as I can. Um, you know, I've been acting since I was nine years old. Um, only only started working in film and television within the last ten years when the industry came to Atlanta. Um, I had moved to LA in the early '90s, trying to make a go of it, but failed miserably and came back here and basically quit acting and opened up a business and ran it for a while. Got married. I did not have any kids, but I'm still married to the same beautiful, lovely woman, Lisa. Hi, honey. <laughs> uh, if she's watching, I doubt she is. Um, and so the film and TV industry, boom, hit it, hit Georgia because of the tax credits. And I, you know, had a good turn with Footloose and then with um, uh, Rectify, things were going well. And then nothing. And then so I got back into theater here in town. I started doing theater. Yeah. Now, back backtrack again. Uh, here in Atlanta, back in the 80s, when I was younger, um, if you wanted to take acting lessons in Atlanta, there were two places to go. There was a place called the Alliance Theater that taught acting classes and a woman named Sandra Dorsey. And that was it. And Sandra was the one that taught the Strasberg method or a technique. And so I went to her through recommendations from other people and studied with her for a couple of years way back. And then I, when I moved to LA in the early 90s, I studied with a gentleman named David LeGrant, who was Sandra's teacher. Okay, David gotcha. And studied with Strasburg himself back in the day in New York. Anyway, and then when I started getting all this stuff happening with film and TV, I thought I need to get my chops better and so I went back to class with Sandra for a year or two a um, couple of years and toward the end of my time with her that second time around she's like Jason you should you, you need to start teaching you know I've taught you everything I can teach you you should you need to start teaching now I was like ah sure you know those who can't do teach Sandra <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I did a play called Speed the Plow um, at a local theater here down the street here called Pinch and Ouch Theater. And uh, I met a guy named Rob Mello. And Rob uh, was the other actor in it with me. There were a female, uh, a male, and myself. And he was the other male actor, Rob Mello. Uh, I played Gould, he played Fox. And he teaches what's called the Meisner method of acting. It's, it's a different method, same idea, you know, to, to gotcha. be real in a circumstances and he said Jason you should teach I'm like, all right you're the second person that's told me that so then I he said well think about it I'm like yeah I'll think about it Rob so about two years later I finally decided okay I'll give this a try and Rob let me try it out at his place I just taught some short little courses and I didn't pee on myself or throw up on anybody and I was like okay this could work and I know the Strasburg method nobody in town's teaching Strasburg I could be the Strasburg guy okay great so I started teaching and that was six years ago. Wow. Do you and I've been teaching for six six years now. Yeah, twenty uh, the fall of twenty fourteen. Do you enjoy it? A five week motorcycle ride across the country, and got my mind right. And when I got back, I said, "Rob, I'm ready to start." And that's when I started. And do you regret that decision, or you're like, "That's one of the <laughs> best decisions I've made." One of the best decisions I've ever made because it allowed me to finally let go of all the other stupid jobs that I had to do to pay the bills. That's awesome. And between acting jobs, the residuals from acting jobs, and it's not a huge income teaching, but the income I make from teaching, I'm able to live my life as an artist, and I'm also able to help up-and-coming performing artists to be their best. That's that's, Which, that's a great story. That's that's just a damn great story. Uh, I told him the other day, I said, honey, I would teach for free if I could afford it. <laughs> would. I really would. Now, I, 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 there was a while there because it's like I loved it, I loved it, and then I started hating it. And now I've really started to love it. I guess because I've gotten better at it. Uh-huh. I, like I trust that I'm, I'm doing good. You know, for a while there I was like, I'm just a fake. I'm full of shit. I'm not helping people. 
And then I kind of figured out, okay, I know what I'm doing. And it, it'd be like Shoeless Joe Jackson. I'd, I'd play for free. That's and awesome. if I could afford it, if I could, I'm practically teaching for free right now anyway during the pandemic. It's, I won't bore you with all those details. But um, if I could teach, if I could afford it, I would, you know, charge them 15 bucks just to pay the light bill, you know. Wow. That's you great. Know. I can't. Not yet. <laughs> I get you. I get you. But that just, it goes to uh, the kind of person you are. And you're you sound, you're a wonderful human being. And you love Nothing. teaching uh, the younger generation all passing on the information. And that's awesome. Uh, yeah. They're not all young, but yes, exactly. The new up and coming. The up and coming stars. Acting artists. Yes. Well, that is awesome. Jason, we are out of time. I want to thank you for being with us. It's been a fascinating hour. I have learned so much from this interview, stuff that I had no idea about. Uh, thank you on behalf of all of our viewers. You've been amazing. Uh, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Uh, people are actually watching. All right. <laughs> yeah, people are actually watching. Uh, hey Thanks for hanging out with us. Yep. Yeah, thank you for hanging out with us, guys. I'll be back on the air again tomorrow night. And remember, stay walking. Good night. Stay walking, baby. <laughs>